welcome to season two of A Good Night for Our Murder, a Victorian true crime podcast. My name is Kim, and in this season opener, we're going to cover a case that encompasses something that I think is a lot of people's worst fears. And if it isn't a fear for you already, it might become one after hearing this case. Sometimes called Angels of Mercy or Angels of Death, this story is about what happens when someone trusted with the care of others abandons their oath to do no harm. This is the story of Jane Japan. But first, a Victorian society tip. I research a lot of old-timey true crime stories, but whenever I research those having to do with the practice of medicine, I run up against a lot of antiquated medical terms for diseases or causes of death, and they send me down a rabbit hole sometimes. So I'm going to share a few interesting terms I've run across for describing symptoms, diagnoses, or causes of death. The first is the phrase softening of the brain. I've seen this used as both a symptom and a cause of death. Sometimes it's written as softening of the brain due to melancholy, as was the case for the cause of death for Cordelia Botkin, who I covered last season. So far as I could tell, this was a catch-all for a variety of mental illnesses where a person may not be in control of all of their faculties. It was also applied when any sort of paralysis was present. For example, it was used in cases of stroke or epilepsy. Another interesting sounding cause of death I've seen is everlasting faint. Symptoms resulting in everlasting faint might be interpreted today as a heart attack. Consumption was quite deadly in the Victorian era. The modern term for this is tuberculosis. It acquired the new name around about 1882 when doctors discovered small tubercles or swellings on affected patients' lungs. But the name consumption was an entirely appropriate name for the disease, as it commonly took weeks to die from and caused significant weight loss and weakness as it progressed. It consumed those afflicted. Convulsions were often listed as a cause of death, as well as diarrhea. These are, of course, symptoms of some other disease, not the cause itself, but they were often listed as the causes of death on old death certificates. Dropsy was another common cause of death. This refers to the buildup of fluid or swelling in the body and applied to anything from kidney disease to heart failure, liver disease, chronic lung disease, malnutrition, or even pregnancy. Natural decay was the term used to describe someone who died of old age in the Victorian era. Nowadays, we understand what the phrase died of old age means, but this won't fly on a death certificate anymore. Certifiers are expected to specify a disease or progression of diseases. Apoplexy was a stroke or aneurysm. They also had all the fevers. A few you might have heard of, like scarlet fever or typhoid fever. A U was a fever from malaria. Childbed fever was from an infection after childbirth, usually the result of poor sanitation practices by the doctor. Brain fever was meningitis. Ship or jail fever was typhus. Spotted fever could refer to meningitis or typhus. Milk fever was from consuming contaminated dairy products. Glandular fever was mononucleosis. Thank goodness for antibiotics, right? For the announcements, I just want to give a quick welcome back for season two. If you're new here, welcome. Plans for this season include more Victorian true crime drama. There will be some updates to the Patreon benefits and more. Speaking of Patreon, I have new patrons Sarah, Melissa, and Melissa L. to welcome. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I did pause Patreon payments while the show was between seasons since no new content was being posted. That's only fair. But now that we're up and running again, there will be bonus content posted at the $5 housekeeper and butler tier to accompany every episode. If you're interested in learning more about Patreon, you can visit a goodnightforamurder.com. One new feature that is already up and running on the website is the Victorian Cemetery Map. It's a map that lists all the burial locations that we know of for all of the offenders and victims that I cover in my episodes. Everyone from season one already has a pin on the map. So if you're interested in a little cemetery wandering, as I always am, you can check that out at a goodnightforamurder.com. I'm also going to take this opportunity to ask you to leave a rating or review on any platform that allows that if you haven't done so already, especially on Apple and Spotify. Those really help more people find the show. Now on to tonight's story. A Good Night for a Murder is a true crime podcast that does cover stories including death, violence, sexual assault, and other adult themes. Tonight's episode does include mentions of sexual assault, child and elder abuse, and suicide. Please take care while listening. Mm-hmm. 
Jane DePan was born Honora Kelly in March 1854 in Boston, Massachusetts. Her parents were Bridget and Peter Kelly, who were both Irish immigrants. She had two older sisters. The first was Delia, who was two years older than her, and their eldest sister was named Nellie. Now, her mother died of tuberculosis when Honora was very young, leaving father Peter to raise his three girls. But Peter had a problem with alcohol, so their home was not a happy one. They struggled financially, and it's likely their father was abusive. It sounds like their father also suffered from some sort of mental illness and was known about town as Kelly the Crack, meaning crackpot, as in they were calling him crazy. There was also a rumor that while trying to earn money as a tailor, he at one point tried to sew his own eyes shut. I'm not sure how much truth there is to that, but bottom line, life must have been very scary and very hard for these three little girls. In 1860, shortly after their mother's death, six-year-old Honora and eight-year-old Delia are placed in the care of the Boston Female Asylum. Boston Female Asylum was an orphanage set up for the care of young girls aged three to 10. In 1860, there were about 100 girls living at the asylum. Some sources say the girls were surrendered there by their father, while others say the girls were taken from him by authorities and placed in the care of the orphanage. For reasons that seem to be unknown, their sister Nellie did not go with them to the Boston Female Asylum. It's reported that she was committed to an insane asylum. We can only speculate on the reason for this. Some that I can think of might be perhaps she was older than the age of 10 and therefore ineligible to be sent to the orphanage. Maybe if their father did surrender them, he thought the insane asylum was just another kind of orphanage that would take an older girl. Maybe Nellie did exhibit symptoms of mental illness the same as her father is said to. Maybe mental illness runs in the family. You'll see what I'm talking about as we get further along in the story. After roughly two years at the Boston Female Asylum, Honora gets adopted. Now, though sources use the word adoption, that's not quite what was happening here. It was policy and procedure for Boston Female Asylum to place girls in respectable homes as indentured servants, meaning the girls are contracted to work in the homes without pay for a specific number of years. Honora was to be adopted by Mrs. Anne C. Topan. Asylum records describe her as a very respectable woman, and the home that she offered to the child appeared to possess many advantages. Honora's sister Delia, by the way, aged out of the orphanage around the same time Honora was adopted and reportedly resorted to sex work thereafter. No more is mentioned of Honora's sisters in the sources I have after this. So Honora is sent to live with the Tapans in Lowell, Massachusetts. Mrs. Tapan has a husband, Abner Tapan, and together they have one daughter named Elizabeth. Now, a lot of sources make it sound like Elizabeth was about the same age as Honora, but from what I found, Elizabeth was pretty much grown, just still living under her parents' roof. So, one of the first things the Tapans do is start calling Honora by the name Jane to sound less Irish. There was a lot of discrimination against the Irish at this time. Also, although they never formally adopted her, she did take on their last name, and this is how she becomes Jane Tapan. Her foster mother, Anne, did send her to school and did provide a safe, stable home for her, but it doesn't sound like she ever really treated her like a daughter. She made sure Jane was aware that she was not and never would be a full-fledged member of the family like her foster sister, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, though, was reported to be very kind and accepting of Jane, and the two women remained in touch as friends years after Jane moved out of the Tapan home. Remember I said that. While in school, Jane had a reputation for being a bit of a storyteller and a troublemaker. First, she made up a lot of stories about her real family, saying her real family was actually royalty and the like. And this is forgivable, right? It's certainly understandable why a child who had a start like Jane did would invent stories about her real family. The problem was her stories were so wild, it was blatantly obvious that Jane was just making stuff up and the other kids didn't want to be friends with a liar. What's more, she liked to make up stories about people she knew as well. She was known for spreading vicious gossip amongst her classmates, then blaming others for starting the rumors. And she was also a tattletale. She was very eager to snitch on her classmates, often trying to pin her own bad behavior on them. So she didn't really have any friends to speak of. Regardless, she finishes school, and when she turns 18, her indentured servitude to the Tapans ends. But she chooses to remain on with them as a living maid for over 10 years. It was during this time that she almost got married once. It's reported that her fiancé left her at the altar, or at least left her quite suddenly, for another woman. After this, she had failed relationship after failed relationship. All this while her foster sister met and married a man named Oramel Brigham. The couple elected to move into the Tapan home, making Elizabeth the new mistress of the house in her parents' declining years, as well as essentially making her Jane's boss. In 
1885, though, it sounds like Jane desired a bit more independence, so she decided she's going to go to nursing school, and she enrolled in a program at Cambridge Hospital in Cambridge, Massachusetts. While there, Jane seemed to excel professionally. Being a nurse was not easy. The work was hard, and the hours were long. But Jane seemed to shoulder the work exceptionally well and with a smile on her face. She earned the nickname Jolly Jane from her patients and coworkers. She gave extra care to especially sick patients, and it seemed like she was even able to often nurse them back to better health with this extra attention. As far as her personal reputation around the hospital, though, those who worked with her a little bit more closely seemed like they could sense something off about Jolly Jane. More than a few people reported that despite her often taking more elderly patients under her wing, they'd heard her remark that she actually detested them and that she saw no use in keeping them alive. What's more, she wasn't always super vigilant in her documentation of her patient's charts, often changing the medicine dosage or administering slightly more or less of a prescribed medicine. For the most part, it sounds like this was put down to just lack of attention. They were trainee nurses after all. But it did kind of happen rather often with Jane, and not everyone was so sure her miscalculations were accidents. Some suspected she was messing with the patient's dosages on purpose. If anyone tried to escalate this, Jane's dark side would come out and she would retaliate by spreading lies and rumors about them. And sometimes it worked. There was at least one instance I found where she got a fellow nurse in trouble that resulted in her losing her job. So while Jane was overall perceived as a good nurse, there were some who could see through her disguise. But they didn't know just how bad she actually was. As it would turn out, the good nurse, Jolly Jane, was leading a bit of a double life. While she put on airs that she was a devoted, compassionate, competent nurse, she was actually anything but. What was really happening with those patients Jane showered extra attention upon was that she was stealing medicine, such as morphine and atropine, and administering them to helpless elderly patients at her whim just to see what would happen. She would experiment with dosage in a way where these patients would be on the brink of consciousness, where they were aware but unable to react. This is when she would miraculously nurse them back to health and receive all the praise for herself, only to turn around and do it again. Sometimes, though, she would not nurse them back to health. In these cases, she would slowly increase their dosage to the point of overdose and stay with them while they slipped away. She later admitted into climbing into bed with them at this point, holding them, speaking to them softly, kissing their faces, and touching and fondling them until they were gone. She actually found this very thrilling and erotic. Unfortunately, elderly sick patients often die during their hospital stays. Plus, the side effects of Jane's chosen cocktail of morphine and atropine often canceled each other out. So at a glance, nothing suspicious was detected. If anyone did suspect anything suspicious, it was either not investigated or taken seriously. So in 1889, Jane received a recommendation for a job at the larger, more prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital. Massachusetts General Hospital ran a tighter ship than Cambridge, though, and they weren't so tolerant of her slip-ups in administering patients' medications and mistakes in her patients' charts. She also had a habit of stealing from her patients' rooms that did not go unnoticed by the other nurses, and it wasn't long before she was fired from Massachusetts General. Though most believe she managed to claim a few victims here, too. One patient, Amelia Finney, would later recall suffering from convulsions while in Jane's care. She remembers at this point, Jane climbed into bed with her and gently stroked and kissed her face, telling her that she would be all right soon. But fortunately, someone else entered the room and interrupted Jane with Amelia, and she was unable to finish what she started. The next day, Amelia convinced herself she was so sick, she must have dreamed that. She would only realize years later that she was actually a survivor of the famed serial killer, Jolly Jane Japan. After being let go from Massachusetts General, she returned briefly to Cambridge Hospital. While there, she tried to pick back up with her old ways, but it seemed like she was under a more watchful eye now. More than one doctor noticed her mistakes in administering opiates to her patients. Others noticed more deaths in the wards where Jane was assigned. Despite this, it didn't seem like they could really prove anything. Though their problem took care of herself when Jane reportedly tried to poison a fellow nurse she got into an altercation with and a doctor found out. After this, she was again fired, and this time reported to the board. As such, she was never able to receive her final nursing license that she would need to work in any regulated facility. So, she begins working as a private nurse, and she would do this for the next eight years or so. In 
While Jane would eventually confess, she didn't really admit to taking any of her patients' lives during this period, though we could never really be sure. When she was working in hospitals, she was afforded a steady stream of potential victims, whereas if she killed her clients as a private nurse, she'd be out of the job. But it's probably reasonable to assume that although Jane had no problem receiving referrals and recommendations during this time, she was still leading that double life of caring nurse by day while indulging her dark, sick fantasies while no one was looking. In about 1895, Jane was renting a room in the home of an elderly couple, Israel and Lovely Dunham. While hourly appeared that Jane tended to gravitate towards elderly patients as a caregiver, we know this was because she actually enjoyed harming them. So when landlord Israel at the age of 83 started to become, quote, feeble and fussy and old and cranky, as Jane described, she deployed her tried and true method of morphine and atropine, and she killed him. His death was ruled as a heart attack. Two years later, she also poisoned his wife, Lovely. She was 87 when she became Jane's victim. Now, remember when I said that Jane and her foster sister, Elizabeth, were actually pretty close despite dramatic differences in their upbringing under the same roof? Well, in 1899... Jane came up with a plan to kill Elizabeth, then marry her husband, Oramel. There is not much explanation of motive here, and I'm not a psychologist, but I'm going to speculate a little bit that Elizabeth and her husband were the closest Jane had ever really come to seeing any kind of working relationship. Remember, Jane was supposedly left for another woman in the only significant relationship she'd ever managed to have. And I imagine she thought, well, if I can't find it myself, I'm going to take it from someone else. And since Elizabeth had remained so welcoming to Jane all these years, she was just the most convenient for her to take it from. I think most would agree that Jane is what we would describe today as a true blue sociopath. The fact that this was essentially her own sister meant nothing to her. Or maybe she had some secret love for her sister's husband and just decided to offer. Who knows? Anyway, for many summers in a row now, Jane had rented a cottage on Cape Cod, a summertime vacation destination in Massachusetts. The summer of 1899, she invited Elizabeth to join her and one day prepared a seaside picnic for them. Jane had secretly slipped strychnine into Elizabeth's water that she had packed. The poison worked quickly, and within hours, Elizabeth was dead. Her cause of death was listed as a stroke. Now, it sounds like following her sister's death, Jane does move back into the Topan home for a while, but it sounds like her efforts to seduce the grieving Oramel were not going as planned because about six months later, she apparently poisons the housekeeper, 45-year-old Florence Calkins, so she can be alone with Oramel and impress him with her own housekeeping skills. I'm unsure how long this goes on, but eventually Jane does move out of Oramel's house. All this time, by the way, she's still working as a private nurse. She apparently claimed at least two more patients as victims during this time. Mary McNear in December of 1899 and William Ingram in January 1900. She also managed to murder a fellow nurse, Sarah Myra Connors, whose job she wanted. She apparently poisoned her to death, then at her funeral, struck up a conversation with Myra's supervisor and shared that Myra had disclosed to her that she was actually planning on leaving her current post soon and had mentioned she planned to recommend Jane for the job. And it worked. She did take over Myra's old job as the matron of St. John's Theological School at Cambridge. But she was bad at it, and she was let go within the year. So all this goes on in the year following her sister's death, and the next summer, she's looking to get away again at that same cottage on Cape Cod. She rented the cottage from Alden and Maddie Davis, a couple in their mid-60s. But she puts on a bit of a sob story about how hard it was to return to the scene where she lost her dear sister only the year before. So the Davises decide to waive her rental fee for that year. The following summer, in 1901, Jane books the cottage again but she doesn't make any mention or effort to pay for it. Jane finishes the stay at the cottage and returns to Boston, where she's currently lodging with a couple by the names of Melvin and Eliza Beadle. Summer cottage landlord Maddie Davis decides to make a trip to Boston to try and collect the money Jane owes she and her husband in person. When Maddie turns up the door, Jane plays it off as it's all misunderstanding, and of course she can pay. Why doesn't Maddie just come in, sit down, have a cold glass of water? And now, if you're screaming, no, Maddie, don't do it, your intuitions are spot on because Jane slips a bit of morphine into Maddie's drink. When Maddie starts to feel woozy, they offer to let her lie down in the spare room and call the doctor. While Maddie is resting, Jane tells the doctor that Maddie is a diabetic and accepted a piece of cake the Beatles offered her, but she's a nurse, so she'll be sure to look after her, and the doctor leaves. Maddie stayed at the Beetle residence for nearly a week, being tended to by Jane before Jane finally does her in as well. 
Jane attends Maddie's funeral, where Maddie and Alden's two adult daughters, Genevieve and Minnie, tell her they know she's known their parents for a while, and they're so grateful to her for her care of their mother in her final days that they'd like her to come and stay with their father and look after him for a while as well. And of course, Jane accepts. She moves into Alden's home, where Genevieve and Minnie are temporarily staying as well. While she's there, she seems to just sort of pile on to the chaos already surrounding Maddie's sudden death. She reportedly started small house fires and tells tall tales of dark strangers she's seen skulking about the house. Then she tells Minnie that she thinks her sister is taking their mother's death particularly hard because she saw her with a tin of arsenic recently. This, of course, is a lie. It's all just a cover story for when Minnie is found to have ended her life by aid of arsenic a short while later. In truth, it was Jane who poisoned her with arsenic. Alden, who has now suddenly lost his wife and daughter in such a short span of time, is so grief-stricken that he passes away as well. At least that's how Jane presents it to the world. The truth is, she, of course, poisoned him too. Now, I can only imagine Jane must have been flying high on some sort of god complex or something, because then she also poisons the other daughter, Minnie. She wiped out this entire family in less than two months' time. And if you're wondering, when is someone going to notice what's going on here? Same. And people do notice. Several newspapers pick up the story of the unusual and unfortunate deaths of the entire Davis family, but foul play is not suspected. Except by Minnie's father-in-law, Captain Paul Gibbs. Captain Gibbs consults Dr. Ira Cushing, who had attended Alden Davis just the day before he died, and he confirmed Captain Gibbs' suspicion that things did not seem entirely on the up and up here. Captain Gibbs was friends with a man named Leonard Woods, who was actually the U.S. military governor of Cuba at the time. He was originally from the Boston area, though, and happened to be visiting during the time that the Alden family was going through all of this. So Captain Gibbs pays him a visit and calls in a favor, as Leonard Woods certainly has the pull to get a full-scale investigation underway. And that's exactly what happens. They assign an investigator to start tailing Jane, and they exhume Minnie's body for an autopsy. Meanwhile, it's only really been two short years since Jane murdered her foster sister Elizabeth, and her brother-in-law has not remarried. So Jane figures she's going to take another shot at wooing her late sister's husband, and she pays him a visit. It sounds like she showed up with some reason that she needed a place to stay for a bit or some such, which Oramel grants her. But when she arrives, she finds Oramel's sister also in residence at the house. And this will not do. She needs to be alone with Oramel so she can impress him with her housekeeping skills, make him fall in love with her, and marry her. So, she poisons Oramel's sister Edna. Oramel rejects any advances or help that Jane offers, though, so Jane moves on to plan B, which is to begin poisoning him. But only just enough so she can make him sick and then nurse him back to health. Clearly, she's hoping she can win over his affections this way. But it doesn't work, and he pretty much orders her out of the house. She goes, but in a last-ditch effort to play in Oramel's empathy, she poisons herself just enough to land herself in the hospital. She is a professional poisoner after all. Now, remember all this time? She's had a detective following her, and he finds it pretty suspect that at every house he's seen her stay in, someone suddenly up and dies, or very suddenly falls ill. He even fakes an illness himself to be admitted to the same hospital she's in when she poisons herself. Meanwhile, toxicology tests on the exhumed body of Minnie Gibbs turn up positive for arsenic, and this provides them enough evidence to make an arrest. Jane is actually staying with a friend in New Hampshire when they go and arrest her on October 29, 1901. But the prosecution is actually having trouble building a case against her. Though it's been uncovered that there are a suspicious number of deaths of otherwise healthy people in her wake, she's only been brought in on charges of murder for Minnie Gibbs. The initial testing on Minnie's body was positive for arsenic, but what they find out is that the levels don't exceed the usual amount that would be used for embalming. Plus, they're not finding any records of Jane making any arsenic purchases. Investigators had a revelation when Minnie's father-in-law gave an interview to the press stating that with her background, he didn't think she'd be dumb enough to use something as detectable as arsenic. He suspected possibly morphine and atropine, which, as we know, was indeed Jane's poison of choice. So, when they tested Minnie's remains for morphine and atropine and started looking into Jane's morphine purchases, they hit the jackpot. The case goes before a grand jury in December 1901, and they decide to indict her. Jane wanted to plead not guilty, and it sounds like they planned to mount an insanity defense, but to be honest, neither defense nor the prosecution wanted this. 
They didn't want to deal with the parade of experts both sides would require if the case were to go before a jury. So they agreed to appoint a panel of psychiatrists to assess Jane, and whatever they said would stand in court. Now, Jane's hope was to be found sane so she could stand trial and then be found innocent. But the doctors quickly picked up on her seeming pathological addiction to lying, and the more she talked, the more she revealed. She admitted she had committed murders before Minnie Gibbs, and that she received sexual satisfaction from laying in bed with her victims while the life drained out of them. Though she seemed to understand her actions were wrong, she didn't fully comprehend why. Unsurprisingly, the doctors unanimously declared her morally insane and unfit to stand trial. So, although they agreed the doctor's verdict would stand in a court of law, they decided to cross their T's and dot their I's and send the case to a jury anyway. Giving a small panel of doctors the ability to put away the criminally insane was a slippery slope, and they didn't want Jane's case to establish precedence for it. So, on June 23, 1902, after eight hours of testimony and 27 minutes of deliberation in a trial that was pretty much just a formality, Jane Zapan was found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed for life to the Taunton Insane Hospital. While the trial was going on, the police had opened investigations to 11 other murders they believed Jane had committed, all which we discussed here. It only came out after the trial that Jane had confessed to her attorney that she suspected her body count was actually closer to about 31 people, although the count could quite easily be upwards of 100. She's been famously quoted as having said her ambition was to, quote, have killed more people, helpless people, than any other man or woman who ever lived. During her time in the Taunton Insane Hospital, the staff and nurses actually liked her. Being in control of all of her faculties, she was a model patient. Though, being in those surroundings took a toll on her, and she began to descend into a manic depression during which she did things like insist on being called by her birth name, insist she wanted to become a nun, and at one point, she refused to eat any food or drink they brought her, fearing it had been poisoned. As she aged, there are accounts of her trying to convince the nurses caring for her to bring her morphine, and together they'd go out into the ward and, quote, have a lot of fun together. Yikes. Jane was 48 at the time she was committed to the Taunton Insane Hospital. She died there in the hospital at the age of 84 on August 19, 1938, and was buried in the Mayflower Hill Cemetery in what was called the Potter's Field section, otherwise known as a pauper's grave. This is where they would bury people who were unknown or unclaimed after their death. Jane Japan often gets billed as America's first female serial killer. While it seems like she may have been the most prolific, there's certainly others who came before her, even that I've covered on this podcast. Lydia Sherman comes to mind. You can listen to her episode from season one. If you head over to Instagram at a good night for a murder, you can see some photos of Jane as a young nurse right before her arrest and a few years after her committal and more. You can also see the photos and source links on the episode blog on my website at a good night for a murder dot com. While you're on the website, you can sign up for the Goodnight for a Murder newsletter. Each month, I send an episode roundup, reveal of next month's episodes, and other goodies like extra Victorian society tips, book recommendations, and more. The bonus content for Housekeeper and Butler tier Patreons for this episode is the story of another famous inmate committed to Taunton Insane Hospital, this time a teenager allegedly convicted of murder. Listen through the outro music to hear a short preview of this Patreon bonus content. To subscribe to Patreon and learn more about the podcast, you can visit a goodnightforamurder.com. Also, follow me on Instagram or TikTok at a goodnightforamurder. Please rate and review and share with friends. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again soon. to accompany episode 23 about Jane Japan, I have the story of another famous inmate committed to the Taunton Insane Hospital for murder, the same hospital Jane was committed to for life. This is the story of Anthony Santo. Anthony Santo was born in Italy in 1894. Between the time he was born and the year 1908 when he was about 14 years old, it sounds like he immigrated to the United States with his family and they were living in Brooklyn, New York. In about April of 1908, Anthony moved to Boston, Massachusetts. He lived here with his cousin and got a job as a water boy on a sore construction project. Two months later, in early June, Anthony got himself into a little bit of trouble. 
He was trying to steal a bicycle and he got caught. While police were questioning him about the...